For Danielle Kelly, the living hell she was forced to endure is almost unimaginable. Well, you got a cerebral palsy child here who looks like she's around 10 or 12 years old. And cerebral palsy kids, which I treat a lot of, they're the happiest freaking kids in the world. Cerebral palsy kids love to hug, love to be touched, love to be kissed. Though you may not want me to say this, I'm going to say it, which is going to sound really nasty coming from a physician, speaking to normal people. This looks like roadkill. Doctors have described to us that for Danielle, her last few months of life must have been like laying on shards of glass. If you were squeamish about such matters, you might want to turn away for the next five seconds. It looks like even parts of clothing or sheets from the bed are interwoven in this muscle and skin. And the ulcerations are all the way through the skin completely, some of it down to the internal organs, all of them down to the bone. The heels are eroded, the backs of the calves, the buttocks, the coccyx, the tailbone, the lumbar spine, the thoracic spine, all the way up to the cervical spine and the back of the head. And I can't see any muscle integrity at all in this child. The nerves over there are still alive. Feeding her would have been impossible. Cleaning this at this point, say even a month before, this child would not have survived. Someone needs to speak for Danielle. There's a term that those that are forced to deal with CPS on a regular basis come to detest. And that term or that expression is in the best interest of the children. That's a catchphrase that's used by CPS to justify any action that they take. And with confidentiality, this is a, a phrase that they use to obtain funding from state senators. And we've had state senators tell us, we don't understand what that means. Recently, an appellate court judge in Oregon said to the attorney general representing DHS, who used that expression, you always say that, the best interest of the children. What does that really mean? And in most cases, it means it's in the best interest of CPS as determined by CPS. It's not the best interest of the children. When you have over a thousand children dying a year, it's not in their best interest. You may be wondering to yourself that since these cases are so horrible, why aren't the parents obtaining contingent attorneys and suing the state over the loss of their children? There's a couple of problems that we've encountered and that we decided to investigate. In just one county that we investigated, we found that not one of the county's judges had ruled against CPS in any permanent guardianship, nor did they rule against CPS in any case involving the termination of parental rights of children's biological parents. Not once in 13 years. We also discovered that the attorneys that are appointed to handle the indigent defendants do not take depositions. They don't call witnesses and in fact, they don't even meet with their clients until minutes before their hearings or trials. It's impossible to win if a judge is not going to rule for you, no matter what. And that's a huge barrier to being able to take the state to court. There are currently two female judges in town who hear most of the DHS cases, and one of the judges has three nieces that all work at DHS, one of them being in a supervisory position. As far as I know, I don't think a whole lot of people know that that's exactly what's going on. Uh, we have a judge, Adkinson, who um, her niece is Chandra Aubrey, and she became a supervisor. Two of her cousins became caseworkers, and of those cousins, two of their friends became caseworkers. Never was any of the clients told that she was related to a good portion of DHS. We're talking about the family court system and CPS, where we want to know why, even though the murders are caught and put away, how could the child have been put into that home? Especially when there are signs that there's abusive people in that home, people who've been arrested for child abuse or spousal abuse or other violent crimes. 
and that happens with regularity. What's even more disturbing is when obvious signs have been reported to CPS of child abuse or potential child abuse that are going on, and CPS has failed to take any action or investigate. Even worse is when they place children into a home and then don't visit them for months at a time, you couldn't possibly see the signs of abuse. Or if they receive reports from neighbors and other concerned people and they don't investigate them and the child winds up dead, who's liable? Is it just a murder or is it CPS as well? But perhaps the most disgusting thing we've ran across is when the CPS caseworker or supervisor turns out to be the abuser of the very children they're placing in these homes. We discovered one judge in Klamath County that actually instructed a CPS worker who was under hot cross-examination by a parent's lawyer that if that CPS worker was uncomfortable answering the questions asked of her by the attorney for the parents, even though she was on the stand and she was under oath, that that worker did not have to answer those questions. That's incredible. I had the opportunity to investigate one case, the Salmons case in particular, where I compared several thousand pages of transcript to the audio recordings that are taken in the courtroom each day during trials. And what I found was shocking. The actual audio recordings are not what's reflected in the transcript. The certified transcript and the certified transcripts are what are included and sent to the appellate court when they're trying to decide if the lower court made a mistake. There were over a thousand errors that I discovered without even having gone through all of the transcript, and some of those errors were substantial. For example, there was testimony, apparent testimony in the transcript that the father was guilty of domestic abuse, that he had beaten his wife or hit her. There was also supposed testimony from the wife which collaborated that. There was also testimony that their baby had been shaken, but yet when I listened to the audio recordings, there was no such testimony, and in fact those questions had never even been asked. There are areas in the courtrooms in the same county where recording cannot take place because the system is so old and out of repair. I approached the state court administrator along with the local state senator and that person told us that she acknowledged that the system was out of date, old, and it was in dire need of repair within the next year. As Senator Witsit pointed out to her, that was great, but what about all the people who'd been through that court and that court system who had transcripts which were wildly inaccurate. And those people today, some of them, have lost their children forever. Mr. Bowen was able to provide me with the audio transcripts of my court proceeding. There were thousands of errors within my transcript. I was employed as the Klamath County Human Resources Manager for Klamath County. And I was employed as a court transcriptionist for the State of Oregon Judicial Department. I did learn at some point there were problems with the Salmon's transcript. The Bowens and Senator Witsit presented all of that evidence and more to the state court administrator, Ms. Kingsley Click. After receiving the information from Senator Witsit and the Bowens, a prodigious amount of information, she wrote a letter stating there was nothing wrong with the new transcript. There was one of them I know and she just had me write an affidavit and sign it saying that I corrected all the motions in the transcript. When Val Paulson went to her meeting in Salem, she portrayed it that I had read the entire 3,000, 4,000 pages of transcript and corrected every single indiscernible, every single word in that transcript, which I hadn't. 